Hey, this is Josh Hewitt from the Straight to the Bar Gym Chats. Welcome back to Gym Chat number 231. And for those of you who are waiting to watch this potentially, apologize for the delay. It looks like there was uh, something going on with uh, the Google Hangouts again, Techmomology. Uh, so we are, uh, I'm happy to have Vic um, McGarry here with us tonight. And he is going to be discussing fat loss and focusing primarily on intermediate and uh, beginner um, tra trainees basically who are pursuing fat loss. So we're going to talk about some of the people just getting into the basics of fat loss and taking it to the next level. Uh, and Vic has a lot of experience uh, in, in this uh, industry and uh, we're going to pick his brain tonight. Before we get into that, Vic, just hang on one second. I want to direct people down below. Uh, I'm going to put a link to check out our sponsors, so definitely go take a peek at them. Uh, and also thanks to my sponsor, SD Pharmaceuticals, for helping us out tonight. Vic, um, before we get started, would you mind just uh, sort of sharing a little bit about your background, how you got into uh, into the field you're into, and, um, and sort of how that led you to where you are today? Sure, great. Uh, Josh, thanks for having me. Well, thanks uh, for coming out, and thanks for your patience, man. <laughs> we were uh, not running around for this. <laughs> Glad you stuck around. Uh, I guess my physical activity or or career, you want to call it, started as a kid. You know, like most of us, play some sort of sports. I was a big karate kid. I was a big karate nerd. Started doing that when I was ten years old. So that was my first exposure to any type of calisthenics or exercises. You know, you have to do those jumping jacks and push-ups whenever you're in the karate class. I remember. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that's where I, I had my initial interest peaked, but I did not actually start studying or delving in seriously into fitness training until I was in the Army. Uh, I had a kind of odd Army path. I entered the U.S. Army Infantry after I went to law school. Uh, very, okay. very odd. You know, I went to yeah, law school. Yeah, usually the other way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah usually it's the other way around, but I had all this student loan debt from mm -hmm. going to law school, and at the time, the Army had a deal. If you did three years in a combat job specialty, uh, I, like I said, I was in the infantry. They would clear your student loan debt. I don't know if they do that anymore. Wow. This is back. This is back in the late 90s. I went in in 98 and was discharged in 2001. So my last year, I was stationed in Seoul, South Korea, <clears throat> and they called that a a hardship tour. And all that mm. meant is that the soldiers were not allowed to bring their families. It wasn't a hard duty. It was I was in Seoul, South Korea. It was you know major city. It was not a hard duty at all. But yeah. whenever you have a bunch of soldiers there who were without their families and don't have anything better to do, they tend to get in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> so my way of staying out of trouble was I started studying fitness training, and I did a, my first fitness certification was via a correspondence course. So I was in Korea doing my studying, writing my essay answers I needed for the exam, and that's where I really got started into kind of formalized uh, fitness education. Right then, from, then from there, I got out, you know, came back to the States, uh, started practicing law, but at the same time I was practicing law, I was always training clients, most of which were lawyers. I would go to their homes in the evenings or even, even go to their offices on the weekends. Lots of lawyers work weekends. Mm -hmm. And and that's how I got my start in, in actually training clients. I would have a backpack full of boxing equipment and a set of those power block dumbbells, and that's all I needed, man. I'd show up at their house ready to rock, and, and that's where I started. So you, uh, most, you mostly did in-homes then, I guess, eh? Just tr you went to them, they didn't come to you sort of thing for the most that's part? How, that's how I got started. And then yeah. I, event I eventually owned a gym and martial arts school in Columbia. Columbus, Ohio for six years. So then I was training clients in my own facility, mm -hmm. which was, you know, pretty bare bones as far as the fitness aspect went. This was, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe 2002 <laughs> to 2006. So before the, the huge CrossFit rage had hit, but it was a lot of similar equipment set up, you know, nothing but barbells and climbing ropes and, you know, very bare bones. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Right on. And so uh, now what would you say the, the majority of... Um the type of clients you see and the majority of work you do. Or, or first of all, are you still involved in law? Or are you just like are you 100% in the fitness industry now, or sort of where where are you at as far as that goes with your? Career? No, I, I took a kind of an unfortunate turn here in the United States. The uh, economy took a pretty big knock in 2008, and I actually lost my gym, went bankrupt. Man, I was that was oh, bottom. Of, yeah, I was bottom of the barrel. So uh, that's kind of what accelerated my work online in the online mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. fitness industry. But now I you know I do both the the online fitness stuff. I don't coach clients too often anymore. Right now, I'm currently not taking clients. I keep the, that pretty small. Yeah. Uh, but I'm also teaching at a local college. I teach their criminal justice program. So that law degree paid off in the end. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
No, exactly. I mean, that's to say, I went through uh, for kinesiology, which is directly applied, but then I worked as a paramedic very briefly, too. And, oh, wow. And a lot of people are like, well, you went to school for that. Why aren't you doing that? But, I mean, we, all, we have to follow our passion, right? But, it, right? but you always find a way that what you've learned in other areas of your life can always apply to what you're doing now, right? There's, there's always a reason for it. So I definitely feel there. Um, so I wanted to get right into what we're talking about uh, tonight, um, looking at fat loss and... Um, uh, we've had a couple of other people on, uh, but I haven't actually talked to a lot of people, um, had a lot of interviews directly related to fat loss as of yet, so uh, I'm looking, to, looking forward to hearing your perspective around it. Before we get into the actual process of fat loss, um, without getting too sciencey on it, but uh, do you want to just briefly talk about uh, what is fat as far as what its role is and why, why is it uh, something that people are, besides aesthetics, I'm, I mean, fat is un unappealing, but uh, <laughs> what is the role of fat in a body? Obviously, we need some body fat, and, yep. and why, is it, why is it important to lose body fat? Well, we do need some body fat, as you mentioned, whether it's for the, uh, the small amount of insulation or, or organ protection or whatever it's going to be, uh, but we don't need nearly as much as most of us carry around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's for damn sure. I mean, but as an energy source as well, you know, the body fat can be used as an energy source, and that's where we want to get our body going in that direction and that's how we end up losing the fat and that is the uh, the difficult part kind of trying to switch our bodies over to where we are using that body fat as yeah. as fuel instead of this uh, constant uh, you know just the ups and downs of diet that can happen yeah uh, you know like you said not without getting too technical about insulin spikes and all of that stuff mm -hmm. you know bottom line is you need to eat some real food move your body and you'll, you'll be okay slowly but surely <laughs> yeah no I, I, I agree with that yeah and, and simplifying the more you can simplify it to the basics uh, for people to follow I think the more likely people are gonna make changes so hopefully you can uh, you can uh, outline some of the the big basic points that people need to follow tonight as well sure um, okay so uh, one thing I wanted to just ask you about first of all for those people who have just like 10 pounds of body fat that they want to lose. They're already fairly lean. They just got that last little bit that they want to get rid of versus people that have, that are obese, that have, sure. that are extremely overweight. Would the process, would you recommend that the, the, the same basic principles apply to them or do they have to approach things a little bit differently? How does that vary? Like uh, from just, from my own perspective, uh, although it's a bigger health concern and it's a bigger issue all, all over emotionally and physically and aesthetically for when someone has a lot of body fat, for and many times it comes off more quickly initially than someone who's already got leaner. There seems to be that sticking point and that stalling point. So, uh, if you sort of talk about why that is and how you might approach it differently if you're very obese, for, or, as opposed to the viewer who just wants to trim up a bit. Sure. Yeah. Wow. That's a that's quite a bit there. So I'm gonna I'm gonna gab here for a yeah, little okay. bit if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I, I I take a look at three main areas, and the main the area that you just asked me about, the one we're gonna talk about is. Uh, what to do, and that is your diet, exercise, and your rest. But then okay. after that, we also have how to do it. Now, when I say how to do it, I'm not talking about the technical aspects of a proper squat or deadlift or something like that. What I'm talking about is habit creation. That's what we come yeah. down to, how to do it. And oftentimes that is very overlooked, but an area that is even more overlooked and oftentimes at the root, particularly those that you mentioned who may be in a serious health situation with obesity, is the why or the why not. And mm -hmm. it, is the why, it is the why not that gets people into trouble it is the, the why not in my opinion the why not is what sometimes we call the elephant in the room it's what right. everybody knows is there but nobody wants to talk about it yeah 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 and uh, I mean let's face it everybody knows what to do to lose weight everybody knows they eat real food reduce your quantity get some movement and you know get your adequate sleep and rest yeah. everyone knows what to do but why don't we do it why don't we do it and addressing those issues can be scary you know, a lot of people, particularly like you're mentioning, those who are very overweight, would probably do better off with a therapist than a fitness trainer. Yeah, I was going to say, it's the, <laughs> the mental aspect is really neglected often in these cases. Yeah, the absolutely. The mindset, psychology of it, yeah. Yeah, but, but to bring it back to your question, let's talk about the what, since that is what most people are going to be initially <laughs> right. drawn to, the diet, mm -hmm. the exercise, the rest. Uh, there's two components there as well that I like to talk about. I like to say there is the macro of fat loss and there is the micro of fat loss. Okay. The, mac the macro is eat real food in appropriate quantity, exercise in a manner that is continually challenging, and allow for adequate rest and recovery. That is the macro. That is the big picture, regardless mm -hmm. of if you want to you know, dial it down diet-wise to paleo or vegetarian or whatever, whether you want to do strength training or high-intensity interval training, whether you want to do uh, 
you know, stress reduction through meditation or through playing with your dog. Those are the micro. Right. Those are the micro. And the micros are going to be individualized for everybody. You know, not okay. one single cookie cutter program is going to work for everybody. Some things work initially, particularly if we're talking to someone who has say, oh, let's say the twenty pound range, which is, you know, not necessarily extremely unhealthy, but still has some aesthetic concerns behind it that someone mm -hmm. wants to turn down. Uh, sure, the big things are gonna work. You know, the big things that I like to see people do, not uh, you know, I'm, I'm not dogmatic in my approach. I'm certainly always flexible, but the big things I like to see people do as far as training, I'm a big fan of heavy strength training and high intensity interval training. I think yeah, that, you know, that, that's just that's just been proven effective time and time yeah. again at this point. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as far as diet, I have a very uh, stepping stepping stone approach I like to take to diet, um, and we can go over that maybe a little later in the call. Sure. But I mean, just to uh, just to get it out there, I, I I like the paleo diet from a uh, a basic standpoint because it focuses on real food so much, mm -hmm. and I think I think it's a good place for people to start. Uh, you know, you eat your your foods that don't have any ingredient labels is is, is a great way to look at <laughs> yeah. it for people. You know, and it, it and if you want to shove that in the paleo camp, fine, go ahead. But uh, to get someone there in an ideal situation, when I'm dealing with a client, I like to take a much longer approach so we fall into that second category I talked about, the how to do it, and we start building those habits because too often people think they can flip a light switch and all of a sudden they're going to change their diet but we have all kind of stuff going on in the brain and the wiring yeah. and it's just it's just not going to happen that way so I like I prefer a step-by-step -step approach that may or may not eventually get down to where we're just eating lots of vegetables some meat fish and eggs small amounts of fruits and nuts uh, we yeah. may or may not get there if they're reaching their goals without having to go all the way there if they're reaching their goals while still eating rice still eating small amounts of potatoes I don't have a problem with that hell I don't have a problem if they're still eating a slice of bread every day as long as they're reaching their goals that's yeah it, yeah, yeah that's what they want to do that's fine with me yeah. uh, but that's kind of like the uh, that's the end of the road I have about a 13 step process that the end of the road would be full paleo okay perfect um, so that gets into uh, the outlines of the, the, I like that your approach, the macros, because then that's what I was sort of talking about, keeping it simple, the basic chunked principles that they know how to follow. And then within that, because a lot of people do get tied up in the details and they'll be like, no, I'm a, I'm flexible dieter and I'm a, I'm a uh, uh, eat clean guy and I'm right. the, I'm paleo. Uh, and and I, I guess it's kind of like losing sight of the forest for the trees. Uh, they forget that the basic principles are there. And I definitely agree with you, and I think most people who are in the fitness industry now that understand that some form of progressive resistance training um, that challenges you, and then choosing at least some uh, intensity within your cardio program uh, rather than focusing on increasing duration, uh, you know, depending on goals. But I, I, th I think those are good foundational principles. And then, uh, yeah, I think being flexible, like you're talking about, uh, taking it on a person-to-person -person basis is important. That's great. Um, so okay, now looking outside of the, and I, I do want to get into sort of what you're talking about a little bit more specifically in, in diet, but uh, looking at um, factors outside of specifically, you know, portions and the food you're eating and everything. And some people have issues outside of, we'll get into the psychology of it, but uh, hormonal issues, digestive issues, uh, other health issues, um, and I have a, a client who uh, his he was diagnosed. I don't know if it's self who diagnosed him it with um, metabolic syndrome, um, which you know a lot of people say is very rare, but I'm seeing more and more of that uh, popping up, and and insulin uh, uh, sensitivity in, and you know diabetes so and I think a lot of that comes from first of all abusing the way they not moving enough and eating you know not eating the right foods or too much or not you know uh, or not enough for an extended period of time so I I, I, I don't know if that's so much a, a genetic issue or if we people brought it on themselves but once you're there what, that obviously opens up other doors is there do you have any thoughts around that is that something you'd see you'd refer to a specialist or what what are your thoughts around when it gets into hormones or digestion and that sort of thing yeah, I think it maybe maybe it's the lawyer in me that that's always leery to to give advice without okay yeah. re, re, without recommending someone see a, a physician if they are having mm -hmm. these kind of hormonal imbalance issues. They, sure, they should get a checkup from a doctor, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think that we have seen over and over again where a good diet and exercise program can reduce things even as serious as type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we I've had plenty of people. Plenty is probably a, a too big of a euphemism to use there, but I've certainly worked with clients who have gotten off of their diabetes medications simply by resorting back to 
eating real food in appropriate quantities and getting that exercise and taking care of their health sm in small steps, step by step, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to that light switch mentality that I was talking about that they have to do it all at once. If they take the long-term approach, it tends to stick uh, more permanently, and that's the kind of thing that helps people get off those medications. Okay, great. Now, if someone were to start on a program um, without getting the specifics of that yet either, how do you recommend people tracking that? Because uh, is it important to look at body fat percentage is it, or is just uh, knowing your body weight or just how clothes fit or how you feel? Um, some people can get obsessive checking their weight every day and that can get it become, you know, hold them back rather than motivate them. Um, what do you use yourself with if you're with a client or what would you re recommend clients use uh, to track their progress? I mean, it, it's important with your strength training programs or exercise to track your pro progress so you know we're progressing. But around um, your body, you know, measurements and food, I think people aren't quite as comfortable with that. What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are generally I recommend clients weigh in once a week and only once a week for the exact reason you mentioned. Oftentimes people have uh, emotional baggage associated with that number on the scale and it's going to naturally flux from day to day. Yeah. Now if someone can disassociate disassociate themselves emotionally from that number and they want to weigh in da daily, you know, that's okay. I mean, I personally weigh in daily when I'm trying to cut weight and because I don't have an emotional attachment to it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of weight loss a lot of weight loss clients do. And so you but you still need a metric to work with and I do think that the number on the scale is the best metric to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, not only because um, what am I trying to say here? It's just a very pra it's an easy measurement to get as opposed to a body fat measurement, mm -hmm. which is which is difficult to get. Whether it's because you have someone who's uh, you know not being consistent with the calipers, or you right. have someone who wants to go get you know the the high tech <laughs> bod pot or whatever, then you've got the the hassle and expense of doing that. The scale works. The scale works right. not ninety to ninety five percent of the time for a weight loss client, especially. Now you have yeah. someone who's who's very lean, very athletic already. Sure, we're we're going to have some some juggling of which you know, which is denser, muscle or fat. We're going to go through all that. But with yeah. a weight loss client, that that number should be going south on the scale. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, yeah. there's no two ways. Don't tell me, oh, I'm building muscle. No, that number should be going south on that scale. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, what, what do you think about that? Is it possible? I mean, I guess if someone's just getting into it, it's different than someone's been doing it for a long time. But uh, the whole idea of building muscle and losing fat, there's a, and there's a lot of uh, uh, programs now, there now that, you know, uh, you know, Increased muscle tissue while you're losing fat, and I and I guess that there's certain circumstances where it's possible and somewhere it's not. But what what are your thoughts on that? Can you can you uh, continue to build muscle in a caloric deficit when you're while you're losing fat, and uh, or under what circumstances could you? Well, I think you have to look. The, once again, we're going to tie it back to the individual person. But someone who's in a truly deconditioned state, which is oftentimes going to be the situation for someone who's, you know, obese, who's been sitting on the couch for the past five years with a very poor mm -hmm. diet, they they have no activity. Absolutely, they're still going to they're going to add muscle. Absolutely, they're going to add muscle, even if they are working in a caloric deficit. Sure, they are. Just because of, of I mean, if walking to the driveway is difficult for you, mm -hmm. then yeah, learning how to do one proper body weight squat is going to assist with muscle. Building it absolutely is, mm -hmm. but you're going you're going to reach a tipping point as well. I think, um, and uh, most weight loss clients don't really need to be concerned with that. There's too too often times we want to we want to split the hairs there. You know, the, go for the big metrics. Is the number on the scale going down? Yes. Are your pants fitting better? Are you seeing a difference in the way your clothes fit? Yes. Do you have more energy? Yes. Are the numbers in the gym going up? Yes. Then you're doing fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're do, you're doing good. fine. Simplify it. What would be a reasonable amount for someone to expect to, to lose? Like if, if to have a goal, you see on the biggest loser, they're they're dropping like huge amounts of, of weight and getting, uh, you know, uh, rewarded for, you know, the, the, the bigger the number on the scale that comes down, the more. Um, and I understand when, when someone's heavier initially, like we like we started with saying, it's they were going to lose the weight more quickly. But sure. what do you think for uh, different clients would be a reasonable or healthy rate of fat loss or number to change on the scale to look for? I think any, anywhere between a half a pound to five pounds per week is, is perfectly adequate and healthy for, say, your average client. For someone who has a lot more to lose, I've had clients lose as much as 11 pounds in a week, and I've seen that happen more, more than once, between 10 to 12 pounds in a week. Hell, I've done that myself. I've cut 10 pounds in a week whenever I've let myself get a little too pudgy. Um, you know, that's not not an unreasonable number at all. To do that week mm -hmm. after week, week after week, yeah, then I think you're getting a little unreasonable. But I think between a half pound to five pounds per week is, is perfectly healthy and, and uh, achievable. 
Okay, good. And that's a that's a pretty broad range there. Good. So so that, so that doesn't put any uh, unrealistic expectations on someone. It's no. You're gonna business. have a good. You're gonna have a good week that rocks, and you're gonna lose four and a half pounds. You're gonna have a week that sucks, and you're gonna lose 0. 0.6 pounds. And and it's just it's not gonna happen in a perfect straight line. It's going there's going to be peaks and valleys, but there should always be a downward trend. And that that's the hook that I think people have to grasp is there are going to be ups, there are going to be downs, but there should be a trend where that number's going down over the span of the six or the 12 weeks or whatever kind of uh, protocol you're working with. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Now, what do you think about, um, we talked about exercise, nutrition, obviously, um, and then other conditions, potentially. Uh, the research out there on sleep and its relationship to, and I guess that relates to stress as well, and, and hormones are involved there to some extent too, but uh, what is your view on sleep? Um, and I don't know if you can tell by my face right now, I'm lacking it a little bit lately, but <laughs> that's my weak point. I'm never not afraid to admit. But um, what, what uh, as far as your experience or, uh, or background, is, what role would sleep play related to fat loss? Sleep is so important that at this point, whenever I have someone come to me that says, I've hit a fat loss plateau, I, I, I haven't lost any weight in the last three weeks. <laughs> this is the order of march that I look at. First and foremost, I look at their diet. Second, I look at their rest and recovery to include sleep being the biggest component. And then lastly, the very last thing I look at is their training. Okay. I mean, that's, that, that is the third place is the training, whereas most people flip that. Most people, well, not, not exactly yeah. flip it, but most people are going to look at, at exercise first. Oh, I need to work out harder. I need to put more time into the gym. No, you probably need to tweak your diet. And if your diet's dialed in, you probably need to get more or more consistent sleep as opposed to increasing or, or adjusting your training. That's that's the last place I look. Mm. No, that's good. Actually, I'm going to make sure I send this when it's recorded uh, to one of my clients who uh, I've just been working with him for, for quite a while now, and he just he decided to take the opportunity. They had another, uh, just had a second kid, oh, wow. uh, and his first uh, child, he, he didn't see me for a long time and let himself go because he j rationalized it that, well, I'm, I'm a new dad. I mean, come on, I have so much going on, and, and that's understandable. Sure. Uh, but, uh, I mean, so I, I don't have to spend focus on on exercise and my nutrition and everything else because uh, then I'll be neglecting my family. You know how we, we can rationalize these things. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so he decided this time, no, I'm going to make this my time to get in shape, and instead of, uh, you know, taking time off, I'm going to hit the, you know, exercise, get top of my nutrition plan, and, and the weight is coming off so slow, and from how he is now finally eating that I got him tracking and nutrition, I got him on a meal plan, uh, and I'm, uh, his, he's training hard, like, and consistently, and it's such small changes, and this, the sleep is not there, he'll just even say, like, oh, well, I was woken up, and I don't know where I can, he, he runs his own business and he has a family and he, so I don't know if I can bring the sleep in, but no, that, I think that, that makes total sense because that's, I even send him for blood work because I was like, let's check your thyroid, check, you know, check your hormones, let's see if there's, if that's happening, had him go to uh, someone to check his digestive enzymes and his, you know, yeah, so that's, I mean, some people have varying different types of metabolisms and whatnot, but uh, uh, yeah, that, uh, that, that's interesting to, to see that you put it even above training in the order of importance there. Uh, wh wh why is that? Is that is that is it is it hormonal or does it just if is it because it throws all your your hormones out of whack and you end up conserving uh, body fat or what? Well, I mean, exactly why to pinpoint it, you know, would be would be tough to do. There's def there are definitely large hormonal issues at at work there. Um, you know, men in particular, your, your testosterone is at a risk of. Uh, being unbalanced if your sleep is wrecked, mm -hmm. uh, and you know we have hormones that regulate appetite and things like that. The ghrelin, yep. that's going to be a wreck as well if you're if you're not getting adequate sleep. So you're going to want to eat more. And then just, I mean, this is a component that I don't think we consider often enough is that your ability to resist that plate of donuts at the office mm -hmm. is diminished if you are under oh, yeah. under rested. You know, we have that that impulse control is is out the window if you're running on five hours of sleep a night. That's true, and I seem to, when I'm short of sleep, it's almost like you, you need something for quick energy. It's you start to crave right. those those sugary, quick, empty calorie sources of energy. I just notice that, like it's just like your body's, uh, you know, n desire to survive and just make it through. So it's give me something that's going to give me a good half hour of a uh, spike of energy. So yeah, definitely the cravings are there. You're resistant. Your you know your willpower is gone. Your thinking is foggy. 
Yeah, I guess it's multifactorial. Um, okay, so this is great. Do you uh, do you mind if we have time to just get into um, a little bit more sp specifics? If you think it, that, that's appropriate with this interview, uh, specifics around exercise. When we talked about just uh, challenge, uh, heavy resistance training of some form, and then uh, high intensity interval training. Um, can you give an example of a of a, a workout or a program, or is that do you think that's getting too much detail for this? No, I don't think it's too much detail at all. I, you know, let's let's take it in in two different aspects. First, let's take someone who is truly fresh off the couch, truly deconditioned, uh, wants to start exercising. The first mm -hmm. exercise that I always recommend is walking. It's the first okay. exercise I recommend. Get outside and walk. Everybody knows how to do it. It is very low risk. And you know, th make that your program for at least the first two weeks, maybe even the first month. Get in the habit of a daily walk. Uh, mm -hmm. From there, I like to move to the basic body weight exercises. You know, the push up, the pull up, and the squat are going to be your foundation, regardless if you're going to move on to exterior resistance with barbells, dumbbells, you know, any other toys weighted you're going to throw around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. weighted belts or, or yeah, whatever. But mm -hmm. even those three movements for someone who's truly deconditioned, you may have to work on it for months or, mm -hmm. or for for a year even. Uh, particularly the pull up. The pull up's a different factor altogether. Uh, you're probably going to actually go toward what I call the body row. Uh, some people call it a reverse inverted pull up row, or inverted yeah. row, something like that. Yeah, you know, where you've got your anchor point that's somewhere around armpit height. Extra extend the body outward in yeah. a plank so you're looking up at the ceiling and you're pulling your body up. That's you typically can, what you're you going to go with. You can hang under a bar, use the jungle right. gym straps or something exactly. like that. Uh, I yeah. mean, I'll also use band-assisted pull-ups around the knees for them when they start to get into the pull-ups. Yes. So there's yeah, a number of ways to assist the movement. Yeah, yeah definitely. And, and the push-up as well, a, a tip I like to use for people who cannot do a, a legitimate full range of motion good technique push-up is I use either a stack of books or magazines I prefer magazines and mm -hmm. I set them right underneath their chest mm -hmm. so, okay. so instead of starting them on the knees I start them on the toes as long as they have the midline strength to hold that plank position and then we put the stack of magazines underneath their chest high okay. enough that they can actually touch it and extend back up to the full extension. So just, doing, just doing partials. Right. Partials. And then we can take those magazines away one at a time until we find their spot where they are not quite there. So then okay. we put that magazine back on there, and within two weeks, we get to take a magazine off. In two more weeks, we take another magazine off. And eventually, that chest is hitting the floor. We've got a nice full range of motion push-up. Okay, good. Interesting. Yeah, I've done it progressively, like on a, like a Smith machine and dropping the bar down, 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 having them do push-ups on that. But, um, yeah, I like this this idea as well. I like anything that gets them actually in that full push-up position, right. like you talked about, planking out. is a, It's a different type of movement when you're kneeling down. It, it's a it, it change totally the mechanics is. a little bit too much. So, yeah, I, I like that. That's good. Um, and then what about uh, high intensity interval training? That's pretty pretty demanding. Like you said, you definitely have someone just starting off walking and then increasing that duration, and then with the basics of resistance training. When and how would you incorporate a, a, a like an interval training cardio program? Uh, sooner rather than later, but you have you have to uh, alter the movements. Let's take a, a fun high intensity movement that a lot of people enjoy the ball slam okay you've got you've got one of those those heavy duty medicine balls that can take a pounding it's lots of fun also cranks the heart rate like crazy but it's going to yep. be it's going to be way too much for someone who is in a deconditioned state to do that with proper full range of motion technique but if you mm -hmm. don't drop all the way down to the bottom of the squat as you're doing a slam. If you just raise the ball overhead and have a slight bend at the knee, we therefore scale the movement so it's still fun, still uh, increases the heart rate of the client, not a problem. Uh, another movement I like to use is a very modified dot drill uh, okay. with the client, assuming that they're, you know, they're at a weight where we're not too worried about the high impact movements because it is mm -hmm. a slightly high impact movement, but that's the way you scale it. You know, the classic dot drill that they use oftentimes for, for football players or whatever, the, the dots are approximately what, a uh, meter apart, you know, some, it's yeah. a little less than that, maybe about two feet apart. Well, you just shorten that. I mean, you shorten that to as, as small as, as six inches and just have them move those feet in the pattern of the dots. And you don't do the complicated movements. You just do the feet out, feet in, feet out, mm -hmm. feet in and back. And that is an excellent one, even for beginners, where they can utilize some of those exercises that can really crank the heart rate. And then, of course, you're going to scale on your duration and your rest intervals as well. Mm -hmm. Whereas someone who's kind of conditioned, you may put them in something like a Tabata interval where they're doing 20 seconds of work, 10 seconds of rest, mm -hmm. where you may, you may flip that severely for someone yeah. who's a beginner where they're doing 5 seconds of work and 20 seconds or even 30 seconds of rest. Right. Uh, 
so you, you have various ways to scale it, but yeah, I mean, start with walking, sure, almost as much to get them in the habit of exercise as it is to get them on their way toward conditioning. Mm -hmm. But w once they're ready, yeah, I like to see I like to see that uh, that high intensity interval started in a scalable manner, in a in a manner that is appropriate for the client, as soon as as soon as we can do it safely. Yeah. Okay, no, I like that too. That's, uh, I mean, I do this similar sort of thing on a stationary bike because I like that it's low impact. Great. But the thing about that, and you talk about progression, I think that's a good place to start. But it gets incredibly boring. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I, I like, I like your idea of incorporating, you know, make it fun. At least make this not something that's grueling to them. And like you said, the medicine ball slams, dot drills, things where they're moving. It's kind of like a game. Uh, that uh, as long as you're progressive with it, that's I, I like that idea as well. So. That's a great way, and then of course the progressing it from uh, uh, you know exercise progressions, intensity progressions, and then duration. That's uh, and duration of rest. Um, I think that covers. Is there anything else around exercise that you wanted to to touch on? I think that gets some good basics for yeah. people to sort of think about as they're getting into it. Yeah. Um, and then uh, uh, as far as nutrition, you, you gave a good outline around paleo. Um, how do you, we we, talk, we know that portioning? You know whether it's you're going to use um, an app to journal every meal and track your calories exactly which people can get really good results from but not many people are going to do. Um, right. How do how do you track and measure once you start really getting into I gotta pay attention to what I eat because that's obviously even more important than we, we recognize than, than exercise. Uh, how do you track that and how would you approach people starting to make those changes in their diet? As we touched on earlier, the uh, I do have a step-by-step -step approach to diet, and the first step that I always ask is for the client to begin keeping a food journal, yeah. uh, and that is not only for them to be build awareness of what they're eating, but also I can't do my job if I can't see what they're eating. I mean, I just mm -hmm. can't do it, it's particularly when I'm working with online clients. I have to know what they're eating, so I so I can make my recommendations based on on the data on exactly what they're eating, as opposed mm -hmm. to just some some whim that I have. Um, yeah. But as far as what to record, how to record it, I personally prefer just using a pen and paper small notebook. And there are three things that I ask clients to keep. What they ate uh, in approximate quantity. Notice I didn't say a specific way your food quantity, just an approximate quantity and the time that they ate it. So what, about how much, and about when. And that's all I ask clients to, to keep. And that has been very effective for me, for, for many clients, to, to recommend adjustments from there. No, that's good. And then I guess if someone was a, a type A anal accountant personality. I, I love you accountants out there. I'm not, I'm not using this <laughs> derogatory thing. But uh, if they wanted to go, you know, uh, hardcore into uh, tracking, like the if it fits your macros kind of flexible dining approach, um, and they're healthy, they're happy with that. Like you were talking about, you can weigh yourself daily because you don't have a right such of thing around it. So then there's nothing wrong with some if someone did want to weigh their food or did want to go to that level, as long as it's something that they feel positive about and helps them as opposed to hinders them. Is that would you agree? I agree 100%. In fact, I tell clients now. Now, you do not have to count calories. However, if it makes you sleep better at night to count them, knock yourself out. Yeah, yeah good. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Yeah. yeah, and I agree with you. I mean, I use an app now just because I, I'm trying to make body composition changes, and I'm already fairly lean, but and now I want to, I want to know a little bit more accurately where I'm at and making small changes. Um, but I, I think looking at the big picture and just being aware of portions and having an idea of, about a palm size or about a half of that, I think that is a really good step. And then, uh, like you talked about, um, a paper journal. I printed out a whole bunch of these for clients too, just because a lot of people don't want to do it on their phone and they don't want right. to search the food. So they'd like to. I, I like the idea of putting pen and paper, and there's something tactile about that too, and it's really easy to see too. So, uh, yeah, I really like the idea of a, of a pen and paper journal that you can just jot in and make notes and go back and touch, uh, you know, add in stuff too. So. Um, and then you have something to just quickly flip back and see, oh, when you do exactly. your ass assessment, wow, this month didn't go very well. Let me look back. Ah, okay. Here's what happened. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, okay, so we, if we, uh, good, we're doing okay for time. If you have time, I'd really like to get into what you touched on at the beginning. I think this is probably, uh, and maybe you agree with me, the, the most important aspect, and we've talked, I've touched on this in other gym chats as well, uh, the mental aspect or what you call your why. Um, and uh, and I w almost always sort of go to the the the, the what or the, the the technical how tos first because people want to hear that right um, but so you know hook them with that and then hopefully they'll listen and take 
this seriously. So let's get into the how do you approach the why and why is it so important that you get your, your head right before you start looking at the map of, of how to get where you want to go? Well, instead of looking at the why, not to be a pessimist or a negative Nancy here, I often think that the bigger issue is the why not. Mm, uh, right. it, are your finances a wreck? Are, are your relationships a wreck? Uh, do you have some sort of childhood trauma that you've never addressed? I mean, these huge, big issues are what gets you put in those donuts in your mouth. I mean, everyone knows you're not supposed to do it, but you have so much emotional stress going on in other aspects of your life that are so imbalanced that it might be a good idea to try to address those first before mm -hmm. you're trying to get six-pack abs. Uh, now, on the flip side of that, the good thing about taking care of your, your physical health, it's something that you always have personal control over. You may not have control of your finances. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this, I've been through that ringer, man. I've been bankrupt, mm -hmm. and it, it, is, it is brutal on your psyche. Yeah. Um, but you can always control what you put in your mouth. You always have the bottom line say as to whether or not you're going to eat the broccoli or the potato chips. You always have the bottom line say whether or not you're going to get up and go for a walk or you're going to stay in bed and hide under the covers all day. Uh, so having that 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 ultimate control falling on you, uh, you know, you can't always control your finances. Sometimes we have those crazy situations. You can't always control the other person in the relationship, so that can be difficult. But we can, bottom line, when we get right down to it, we can always take ultimate responsibility for our physical health. Mm -hmm. That's easier said than done, but it's absolutely true. And I think if people can get that idea that taking responsibility because we have control over it, as um, uh, look at it as something that's very empowering, that, right. that, that, exactly. that, that say, oh, this is awesome because it's something that I can have, the, I'm the one that has the most influence over my body. Uh, rather than seeing it as like, oh, you have to take responsibility, as it's like a, a blame game or a fault. It's your fault that you're overweight. It's it's not about that. It's like, no, it's your responsibility because you have you're the one that's the the in control here in the in the in the, in the driver's seat. Absolutely, absolutely. It, it it can be very empowering, especially for someone who is in in the midst of other situations that are feeling very disempowering. It can be a way to, to regain control and regain power. But in the event that it's not, I mean, I was serious when I said at the beginning of the call, some people need counseling more than they need a fitness trainer. And, and, and don't be afraid to go that route if, if you need that. Get the help you need, particularly if you have addiction issues. You know, get that stuff fixed before you start worried about trying to get a, a double body weight deadlift. Get that stuff addressed. Mm -hmm. Cool. Do you have any uh, any other just uh, this is a topic obviously we could do a whole interview on, uh, but do you have any sort of um, basic outlines or steps as far as the the why and why not that when people are starting to get that okay I want to get my head right uh, to approach this correctly, like something just basic that they can start with like start focusing sure. or start thinking about or a little exercise that they can use to to help direct them. Absolutely. Let's let's switch gears now back to the why. Since I, I dove into the why not, <laughs> let's talk about the why. And a lot of times people will look to things like, oh, I have a beach vacation coming up, so I want to fit into my bikini or get six pack abs or <laughs> or whatever. That stuff is so fleeting; it's not going to last. The one thing that you can always find your why is you have to look outside of yourself. You have to look to how are you going to serve others. And you cannot serve others optimally unless you have optimized your health. Now, a lot of people can look toward their immediate family. A lot of people can look toward their children, their mm -hmm. spouse, and say, hey, you know what? I can't be the best dad. I can't be the best father. I can't be the best spouse unless I'm in my best shape. That is my responsibility. That is my motivation. That is my why. Now, not everyone's going to be in that situation, myself in particular. I'm single. I have no children. I have a very small, immediate family. So who who is my why? Well, my readers, my listeners on my podcast, uh, the clients I serve, I cannot serve them ultimately unless I stay in shape myself. Or, or hell, my dog, man. I love my dog. If anyone yeah. does read my blog out there, they'll see pictures of my dog all over the place. You know, <laughs> I, I can't be the best pet parent unless I'm in you know, taking care of my own physical health. So whenever you look outside of yourself, whether that's to your family members that you take care of or others that you serve in whatever capacity that may be, maybe it's your career, maybe it's your volunteer work, maybe it's your blog readers, maybe it's your dog, uh, but there's always someone else we can serve outside of ourselves, and I think that's where you're going to find that lasting why or that lasting motivation. I like that. Yeah, that's uh, it. Makes it not feel like a selfish thing that you want to do this for yourself. It's it's how can I be a value to others? What can I? What sort of greater good can I provide by being the best person I can be, physically and mentally and everything else? So that's I like. I agree with that. And that's also with business and everything else too. If you're focusing on uh, your finances and and growing your business and uh, becoming better in, in your business, if you 
if your motivation is to provide better service to others or to, to provide a better a greater value with what you do, it takes it off of what's for me and, and what and it becomes how can I serve, what can I do for others? And it always ends up benefiting you if you take that approach too. Yes, I agree. Absolutely. Okay, this is great. I think we covered quite a bit. For this is a lot for people to dige digest, and I really like the fact not only that you're a fast talker, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we got a lot of information in here. But you really chunked it out well, and those are very digestible pieces uh, pieces of um, you know approach for people to take around this. If people did want to learn more and they wanted to find out more about your approach to this, or if you have resources, you're doing a lot online now. You said so. Right. That's great. So that listeners watching this online, our viewers. Uh, could access that. Where would they look, and what do you have that would be available for for viewers? They can always uh, check out my blog. That's vicmcgarry.com. That uh, should be up here on the screen if I did my little uh, yeah. lower third thing right. Uh, I'll make sure I'll make sure all the links are below as well for those okay. who are watching. And then also that they can. Uh, get a free fat loss program at fatlossforfree.com. That is a full-fledged uh, program. It includes four different 12-week programs. It includes 68 instructional videos, 12-week menu, and a 20-minute uh, jumpstart audio program as well. Uh, just head over to that page, fatlossforfree.com, submit your email address, and you'll get access to all that material. Awesome. Okay, so that is uh, fat loss for F O R, right? Free. Yes, sir. That is okay, correct. Okay, good. And I'll put that link down below as well. And I'll keep you on the chat just for a second after we sign off to make sure I have all your information. So people uh, who are watching this, just check out uh, the description below the video, and uh, and you can access all of that. Uh, if people want to get a hold of you directly, personally, uh, what's the best email? Facebook or how do you connect with people? Uh, Facebook, no. No one can message me on Facebook. I, I cut that off my page. Uh, okay. I, I'm very responsive to email, though, typically within 48 hours, and that is vic at vicmcgarry.com. Okay. Excellent. So I'll include all of those. Vic, was there anything else that you wanted to uh, touch on before we, we sign off? No, not at all. Josh, once again, thanks for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate it. This was a great chat. Would you be willing to come back uh, uh, in the future in a couple months and uh, touch base? I think I think any of these areas that we talked on, if you're open to it, I think we could really get into any one of them uh, more specifically, just talking about the nutritional aspect or just getting to the exercise or, or, or getting to the, the, your why, the mental part. Uh, would you be up for that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Anytime you, you uh, would, would like to have me on the show, I'm, I, I would love to be back. Great. I'd love to have you back on. So we'll do it again. Thanks again for joining us, Vic. Thanks, Josh. Okay, and thanks to everyone else out there for watching. Until next time, stay strong.